Hi, I'm Dr. Barbara Becker Holstein, originator of the Enchanted Self, a way to see life in a more blissful way and to live a more dedicated life with purpose and joy. Tonight, I'm going to wear a slightly slanted hat that goes with the Enchanted Self because, of course, to be enchanted, you must take care of your garden and uh, the valley that you live in, the world you live in, or it's going to be awfully hard to have enchantment. And um, I've de decided as a psychologist that's been in private practice over 30 years, so longer than at least two of you have been alive, <laughs> that um, it's very important that I use my purpose in life to also help people understand the problems that we face and some, uh, some ways to look for solutions and improvements. And one of the problems that really faces kids in our country right now is an increased amount of anxiety, which is being documented again and again in uh, many of the newspapers, many of the articles, and many of the kids can tell you we don't even have to read a newspaper or watch the news to see the exhaustion and see the anxiety that a lot of kids are experiencing in school, no matter what the grade, whether it's first grade or junior year in college. And um, we've got so many examples. I don't want to burden us with examples, but they are there. And many of the examples are being exaggerated in today's world by the shootings that have happened in schools and the lockdown procedures that go with protecting children. So some of this show today is going to be around that subject. Um, I hope that bringing up this subject will lead not to despair, but to the, the hope that I do believe springs eternal in the concepts of the Constitution and the democracy we live in, and we will always find solutions. So to find a solution, we must be willing to look at the problem to some extent. I have a great cast of characters here to help me with this show. <laughs> we, <laughs> we've always had fun and we always make a point, many points. Uh, so I'm going to, first of all, let each, um, each person introduce herself we hope to have uh, one gentleman uh, who was going to be here also, but he fell playing soccer. <laughs> so we're going to have to oh, wait no. till next month. And that's Rich Hall that has done some editing for me, some filming, and uh, he'll be back. All right, let's start with um, Teresa. We'll go around and then we'll go to um, Madison in Florida on FaceTime. Hi, my name is Teresa Cuesta. I am a school librarian in a private school. I've been a librarian for over 20 years and served in situations where are there are emergencies and lockdowns in corporate, public, and private sectors. Wow. My name is Elena Cuesta. I've been in a few of Dr. Holstein's films, most recently the one about the lockdown. And it was, it was great to do, and I think it was great for a lot of people to see. My name is Doreen Lapperdon Addison. I'm a somatic movement educator, <coughs> excuse me, and I've worked with Dr. Barbara Becker Holstein for a number of years with the the inception of the Enchanted Self many, many years ago. We've worked on several projects and now I'm very happy to be back and uh, having this discussion, very important discussion. Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, my name is Carrie. Um, I'm actually a librarian also, but I wasn't going to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I'm also a writer, and I used to be a filmmaker. That's what I went to college for. Um, and we're going to watch one of my films that I made in college today that's about a, a mother of a school shooter. It's fiction, but it was shot like documentary style. That's wow. great. Mm. Well, nice to meet a fellow librarian. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. And uh, can you hear us, Madison? 
Yes, I can. All right, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Madison. Um, I'm in 11th grade. I go to Lake Mary High School. Um, and I've experienced a natural life shooting at my school, which is really tragic, and I'm glad we're talking about it at the moment. And yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe the most um, realistic way to jump in is to have you talk a little bit about the shooting that you experienced. If you, would that be okay? Yeah, that's totally fine. You're on. Okay. <laughs> um, so it was really felt like an odd day that day, like had a gut feeling. And as I'm going to second period, I hear people screaming. And like, it's kind of weird because you're talking, you're walking to class and you hear people scream at you to go to classes or hide. And all I knew what to do was just like, pick up everything and run to like the nearest thing I can like hide in. And the whole time, Everyone's talking about it and trying to figure out who, like, what happened. Is everyone safe? I text my mom and my dad first just to see, like, to notify them. And and then someone keeps saying about um, an actual suicide was the main thing that happened. And it was just kind of tragic that whole time. It was unbelievable it's like it's you just don't want it like it's really like sad because you knew the part like okay so the person that it was was a fellow ramster she was in band she was a gorgeous girl and it was sad because people kept saying it was other another person that I knew and I started crying and I was panicking because I just I thought it was her and then they found out it was another person I knew this person since like middle school but I haven't got it like to talk to her since then and it's kind of like realizing it was another friend of yours was just like horrible and it was just like from going to class to class that day was just so shocking and like you everyone felt numb from it it was really scary that moment so actually I'm a little confused there wasn't a shooter from the outside but there was a kid that took her own life yes and then they lifted uh, the alert at some point yes ma'am and you had to finish the day. We don't have to finish the day. Some kids did, but some of them said they allowed us to leave school once it happened. Uh huh. Uh -huh. If someone drove to school, this is unexcused, and you can leave. Mm -hmm. And then if you didn't have a ride, you would have to wait until your parent or guardian mm -hmm. comes pick you up. And were there any guidance counselors or school psychologists or anybody trying yeah. to handle the talk to the kids? Yes, ma'am, there was. Uh -huh. There was a lot of them. Mm -hmm. We would go, I went in third period that day, and I went with another friend, and just coming into that room was just so horrible and sad because, like, seeing everyone crying. And I think, like, the therapist and counselors were very very like brilliant at it to teaching that at teaching us the like it's gonna be okay you're okay and then they would talk to you like nothing happened but they didn't say who it was so they're like it's gonna be okay don't overthink it was yeah. that good advice or you feel it was too superficial um i think it was good uh-huh I really like took it to heart when the lady talked to me mm -hmm, about it mm -hmm. and then having it like another friend talk to her talk about it and it was kind of like sad seeing a friend talk about her issues as well during that moment so and when did this take place again this took place I believe the 
day before um, spring break. So it's quite recent. Yes. Yeah. Can I, I can I ask a quick please. question? Was it? Did they think it was an active shooter, or was it a suicide at the school? They thought it was an active shooter, and then they found out that it was a student. Not threatening other students? No, ma'am. Okay. Well, it's such a... I feel almost chilled just listening to Madison. You know, you go to the theater or the movies, and you have a whole range of emotions... And I've certainly cried and made noises with my tears and all sorts of things at movies and plays. And this is different. It's almost like a weight was put on me. So I can only imagine from, from Madison herself. Yeah. I have a sense when Madison, when you were speaking and describing the incident, how uh, emotional uh, an experience this was, obviously. Um, how it's still raw inside of you and, and trying to make meaning and sense if one can do that. And my experience on a somatic level listening to you was I was feeling very um, uh, tense, mm -hmm. contracted <laughs> in this right area, here. right in the heart chakra, yeah. you know, and um, just empathizing with how your description. And then when you spoke after Dr. Holstein, Spoke, asked you certain questions about the guidance counselors and and my first response is wow that sounds really superficial and yet it brought you such comfort knowing you would be okay and then sharing and then a smile see just like now there's a smile on your face and I went Phew, okay yeah, I'm glad <laughs> yeah I, I it, it sounds like you're getting through it do you think that it was augmented Madison by the news carrying shootings around the country you know that this is a situation that kids are facing does that augment it or would it have been just as strong even if nothing had ever happened anywhere else in our country um Or maybe that's not a fear question, you know. It's yeah, I believe it's kind of like trying to like think about a good way to play explaining. Um, do you mind repeating the question? Yeah, again? that's a, I can. <laughs> I'm going to change the <laughs> I'm going to change the question on a little different slant. Tell us more about anxiety in your life in general. You said you're 16, is that correct? I'm 17. 17, I'm sorry. It's fine. Okay, <laughs> you're 17 years old, you're 18, okay. So tell us some of the anxiety that you feel academically, you know, school-wise, worrying about college loans, you know, different things. Where are you, are you sitting within experiencing some anxiety? Um, I believe my anxiety is mainly on is the, like, which college am I going to go to? What's going to happen tomorrow? Like, those basic things, because we came and do the code red, like a practice code red at our school because people are having um, anxiety attacks, panic attacks because of it because of that sp specific mm -hmm. reason and I believe it's like it's very anxious when it comes to that. So the a code red in your state is that like a lockdown? A, a, a practice yeah. lockdown? Yes ma'am. And you're saying that it makes the kids so anxious that it's hard for them to sort of function in general. Yes, ma'am. Are some of them staying out of school? Do they? Is there any warning when you may have it? Um, usually, when they practice a code red, they don't really notify us because they mm -hmm. act, they want to make us know for sure that it, it's like, what if this happens? So like they don't tell us ahead of time. And, like, randomly in class, it would be like, we have a large, um, a large, a loud sound of 
like a guy talking to us saying code red code red and from there our teachers teach us how to like hide from the gunner like the guy with the gun and we hide Mm -hmm. and we try to protect ourselves we even one time i barricaded a door just to practice to like Mm -hmm. what would what if the guy comes into that school or a girl comes to the school? Yeah, we've had that in schools where they will barricade exits to make you make decisions on where to go if you have to leave really quickly or in fear or flee. They will blockade things that you think and do that. I was even told on a second floor if I was teaching, break the window, use anything and get out, even if it wasn't real, even if it was a test like you're saying. They told us to act like it was real no matter what. And that's kind of frightening because you just don't know when you get that code red like you have. Mm -hmm. But you have to act like it. That is frightening. But we, at our school, all we really do is just do um, the lockdown. We've we've never, like, they've never actually had to have us, like, barricade the door, like, practice. What if someone actually comes in, which I think is obviously really important. And just the other day, actually, we had a lockdown. And um, we, it was a new, it was a different kind of lockdown we've never had before. It was a lockdown, and then they pulled the fire drill. Mm. And our teacher, just before or as the lockdown, we got the announcement um, on this loudspeaker. She said they might try to pull the fire alarm because she said that in I think it was a nearby school or a school somewhere I don't remember, but she said they had a lockdown and the shooter pulled the fire drill and everybody went out of the school and then he got people. Yes, so. that's a true. I forget where, but right. that's a true episode. Yeah. Can I, can yes, I uh, interject uh, for both of you, Elaine yeah. and Madison, a two-fold question. Um, for Madison, <clears throat> since you experienced uh, an incident in your school and you've been practicing these lockdowns, is there a difference in how you and your classmates, some of your friends, respond previous to this incident and then post-incident? Um, before the incident, we pretty much just like hid really and like did the barricaded and we felt safe from there because we had the teacher there talking to us the whole time and then after it 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 really just like made everyone panic everyone was hyperventilating they're frankly talking to their mom and dad it's really a huge change from it Okay, and Elena, how about you? Uh, thankfully, you have not experienced an active shooter or any other incident. But how is the um, the presence when you go through this? How do people respond? Are they anxious or they just go, oh, we're just having this lockdown? I feel like the, the oh, we're just having this lockdown used to, used, to, used to be how we would feel maybe even a few years ago when I was maybe a freshman and still in middle school, there's, you know, oh, it's a lockdown. But now because of the more frequent shootings everyone's just become to think like you know this there might be the off chance that this might be our school at some point and it does make me nervous too like when we had our lockdown my my boyfriend was in the same class as me and so we hid in the same area but then we were running out of space so he went around the other end and that just made me like kind of scared to be honest because if someone came in there I wouldn't be able to even see him because he was across from a desk from me and I couldn't see him but yeah, it is it is a little anxiety inducing, but when you get the two all clears on the loudspeaker, you know it's okay and it's just a drill. Do you find you have for either one of you a sigh, a physical sigh of relief? What goes on with you? How do you experience the uh, fact that thankfully it was not and you're done with this lockdown drill? How do you feel if you're feeling anxiety and obviously from doing this drill for both of you, um, how do you experience what is your feeling afterwards? Yeah, I do kind of breathe that sigh of relief, like, you know, it's just, it's just a drill. But, um, you know, I sometimes think about whenever we have a drill, I'm like, you know, what about the tiny chance, like, what if this is real? And all and all the past times, thank God, it hasn't been, of course, but you still feel that anxiety during it. But when after it's over, you're like, okay, you know, it's it's not real, it's just another drill. And then... Every time we have, it just kind of makes me think of the the situations that a lot of other schools have faced in the past, and I'm, I, it just makes me think. Mm-hmm. Madison, how do you feel, like, when, thankfully, well, you don't have the drills now because of the anxiety and stress, so? Well, I think under the law, 
um, there's a certain number of drills. I know in New Jersey it's a very high number, but I think in Florida it may not. It not, might be a much lower number. Um, I guess that's a state to state decision. But um, last time when we had the podcast and we had a principal here from the from a lower elementary school like K through three, he was saying how even the administrators are terribly ambivalent about the lockdowns in the sense that they know it creates tremendous anxiety, but they're caught between a rock and a hard place because if the kids don't practice to become somewhat automatic, how will they do in, if it's real? Mm -hmm. Which I guess is the endless question. So Madison, they haven't had any other fire drills or lockdowns since break, right? Um, since break, we haven't had a code red, but we had have, um, has had a fire drill. And during those, we can't go out of the building until two minutes. We have to wait two minutes. And then once they say it's clear to go out, we go out. And we go from the, um, our football, we go to all the way to the football field when so, we go out. So they're kind of waiting to make sure they can send you outside safely, even if it's a fire? Yes, ma'am. Wow. wow. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. For, for us, we just immediately go straight out. Yeah. I didn't know that our schools did that. It, it's a new thing that they started. And I interviewed a young uh, fellow who's 17 also who couldn't come tonight, and I, I, I actually took some notes from him. And he said that um, some of the kids, you know, really fool around. Some of them take it very seriously. Um, but there was an email that went around at one point the night before this incident that turned into nothing, but it was an a email implying there would be trouble in the school the next day. Something was going to happen. And of course the police were notified and whatever, but he as well as a lot of other kids just stayed home. And he said that he clearly made the decision to protect himself rather than going to school. It wasn't worth it to him, even if by the morning they thought it was a hoax, he wasn't going to go to school. So, you know, it made a very strong impression on him. And, um, He's not going to risk himself. Um, so uh, it, it is different in every school. And he was telling me um, that they they do have more fire drills than lockdowns, but they do have a lot. Of, they do have lockdowns at least three or four times a year. I've been in schools where there is security. There are security guards, ex police officers who are around. Um, do you have that at your school, Madison, now, or did you have it before? We've had it the whole time. You've always we had, had security? Yes, we so had, does my school. Um, we had, I think, I believe, maybe three deputies, and yeah, there's only three deputies that we have in the main school, but sometimes we'll have another, like an extra four, just in case, like they heard something. Because and stuff uh, still happens. A similar thing happened to me with the um, I forget his name. The the little the boy that couldn't make it. Um, the little yes one, yes uh, oh, yes. I don't remember. Michael. Uh, Michael. Okay. Um, the same thing is me is the same thing is for my school as well with the the false thing that happened. Like they said this is gonna happen and nothing happened, and people stayed home some the whole day that happened as well because it's not like like it's pretty much like every school has it so. I, I just have a question for both of you uh being in school since these school shootings uh has has security increased remained the same that's Where a good go? sorry <laughs> that that's a good question actually um now that i think of it I actually think you may be right, or at least I see them more often. I feel like uh, three or maybe two years ago, I'd only see like a security officer here and there, and maybe a police officer every long once in a while. 
But now it's about every single day I see at least several police officers and security. How about you, Madison? Um, same here, but we also have, um, oh God, what's it called? Um, the deputies, you were calling them? We have the deputies, and then we have the, um, not counselors, um, extra teachers outside. Uh -huh. Yes, okay. As well during lunch right. and when class is passed. Yep. Well, how does that make you feel? Like safe. knowing there's safe, safer, safe. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, safer. Safe. And it kind of helps you recognize the problem that's going around in other schools more. Cause I, I didn't actually even think about that or notice that, that I, that there are more police officers and security officers going around the school mm -hmm. more often. It does change the nature of the school building. And, um, you know, of course for us older people over 30 ish, even, we remember schools that were pretty much an open door. You forgot your lunch, your mother or father walked in mm -hmm. into the principal's office or da even down the corridor right to your room and the bag was dangling, you know, come and get your bag, you forgot your lunch. And it's such a, a different entrance and exit in today's world. So people can accustom to that, I get that, we can accustom. But I think the general heightened anxiety level we all pay a price for in some way. And this kind of segues into Carrie's film because um, Carrie's film talks, well, I shouldn't say talks, but is about the mother of a shooter, not the mother of somebody that's hurt or killed. And I think as a society, we don't focus enough on all sorts of aspects of the people who end up in a criminal nature of any kind. Um, you know, the mental health aspects, the poverty, the poor parenting, endless factors that may play in to somebody. And I loved when I was last here and we were talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you were like, I don't want to think of it as needs. I mean, they're important, but if a child isn't soothed by those needs, if they don't have that soothing feeling from having that stability, it also is a myth. Yes, they can have yes. the needs, but without feeling a soothing feeling right. from that. And I love that word that you use. I really have thought about that quite a lot. Yes, well, I think it is a very important concept. Um, if we're not soothed, we're on edge, we're irritated. And that goes back to the kids who are now more anxious too because they may have the greatest parents in the world that tuck them in, in to bed and sit on their bed and talk even if they're 16 or 17. But if the anxiety level has increased, they're gonna need more soothing. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll come back to the soothing. I want Carrie to just tell us a tiny bit about your film before we see it. And even before we see your film, we're gonna see the 30 seconds of the kids where Elena was in the film, uh, where they're suddenly faced with a lockdown. So um, go ahead and tell us a little bit, please. Sure, um, so I made, this was my college thesis film that I made in 2012 and I don't really know why I chose this topic, to be honest. Um, I think I was just thinking about different things that interested me, and I, I was just, I think the central question that I was most interested in was just like the ways in which people can never know other people, even people that are really close to them. So I wanted to focus not on the person who committed something like this or other victims, but I wanted to look at the people who either get blamed or get forgotten about, which are like their families, because um, I just thought that was something that there, there might be something there. Um, and we shot this in, I think, just one day, um, and our actress was really great. She's actually gone on to do some, she was like in House of Cards, and she's done a lot of really cool things, and we were very lucky that we got her for this. Um, and yeah. So. How many of you worked on the thesis? Um, I wrote it and did the filming and then I had a co-editor and the person who helped me edit was also um, the director, 
the day of, and um, I guess we also called her the producer, maybe. Um, so you had two major people yeah. and an actress. Right, and then we had somebody doing sound, mm -hmm. and we had um, like another person on set to just sort of be an assistant and help with um, everything, you know, sounds, whatever sounds. needed equipment. Yeah. And, keeping the animals in the house quiet because yeah. <laughs> there's like a dog and some cats Aww. and stuff. Um, I did a group uh, thesis with two other women when I was at Boston University and I always felt that it was so wonderful to do my master's that way. You, you kind of get rolling. It's so exciting to not be totally yeah, alone on the probably. project. Yeah, and then we had, you know, we had a colorist and, mm -hmm. and somebody do like post sound work on it and stuff too. Yeah. So there, it was a normal not stuff. just like a lone wolf situation right. but right. it's pretty small crew we, we did as like little as possible sure well let's play the 30 second and then we'll play the six minute film that is carrie's Uh, is higher when they listen. Okay. So we want to do the six minute now. Okay. Yeah, that was Kay. intense. Yeah, that well, that very, built yeah. anxiety in just those few seconds. It really yeah. did. Yeah. How did that feel filming it? Uh, feel f filming it. Uh, I kind of had to put myself into that situation and think, what would this nervous, yet at the same time caring character do in this kind of situation? And in the beginning, it was kind of like a bit of a panic because you don't know what to do. But um, once we got into the bathroom stall, Melissa's like caring character You're came Melissa. into play. Yep, Melissa's caring character came into play, and she comforted the the one girl who was always mean, really mean to her for really no reason that she could think of. But she knew that because they were in such a, a terrible crisis, you know, you have to put your differences aside and protect each other. Mm. So important. Yes. Every time he came home without fail, he would, even when he was with his friends, he'd pick wildflowers for me, and the stems would just get all grubby. Oh. Yeah, I just thought that was the sweetest thing. He was the sweetest boy. He really liked being in nature when he was in high school. He like to spend time in the woods and on the beach. Uh, he actually built a fort in the backyard. I think it was kind of a safe haven for him when he was in high school. And I um, didn't think too much of it. He liked to spend, you know, time alone. And um, so I let him have it. <clears throat> I... I actually don't remember a whole lot about that day. I remember the fear and the praying. I just thought, worst case scenario, he was hurt. You know, I couldn't even imagine that he was killed. Of course, I had no possible way of knowing what actually did happen. It's hard enough to lose your child. But it's harder to lose the right to say you knew your child. A couple of months after the tragedy, I sent cards to all the families. Some are more receptive to hearing from me than others. 
I said I was sorry, but you know, how often is sorry ever good enough? I didn't teach my son to hate. I told him I loved him every night before he went to bed. I praised his grades. I went to his school functions. I told him he could invite friends over to dinner. I think people find comfort and blame. I think if they can look at me and say that I caused this in some way, it, you know, it makes some families feel better. That's fine. The one on the mantle? You can look at it, I can't. At least not on a daily basis. It's the picture that the TV stations used, the face of a killer, they called it. I used to look at that and see my son. I remember he hated that shirt. I had to bribe him with a CD just so he would wear that shirt. I said, you wear that shirt and I will give you a CD. He was 16 years old and I still had to do that stuff with him. He was so difficult and defiant sometimes. But I got him to wear the shirt. Now it's the picture the whole country has seen. It doesn't even feel like mine anymore. Oh, well, it took a few years, but uh, I feel pretty comfortable in the community again. My neighbors will say good morning to me now, and I don't tremble every time I hand over my credit card at the grocery store. I knew it would be hard to stay in town, but I felt like if I left, I'd be running away, like I was admitting some sort of guilt, like I deserved punishment. I bought this house. I'm proud of it. Well, my sister and I don't really talk anymore. I used to babysit her kids on a weekly basis, but we don't, she doesn't talk to me. My mom and I talk. She calls me every week. We don't talk about Caleb or anything. I used to uh, think that when Caleb went off to college, I might start dating, you know, work on getting a new wardrobe. <laughs> My parents take a class, maybe. Uh, doesn't seem like that's much of an option anymore, but. I agreed to let you interview me because maybe it'll prevent something or some mother out there is going through something similar and will feel better, I don't know. But, you know, I guess something inside of me just wants to, to know that what he did, I could turn it around into something positive. Well, what's your body feeling now? I have some general malaise in my body. Yeah. Heavy. Even heavy. It's heavy. It does it's exactly. heavy. Yeah, heavy. Heavy. Weighted. Yeah. Um, you could feel her burden. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Did we lose our friend? And I'll see back there. Yeah. Um, I think it's a very powerful movie, Carrie. Thank you. I hope you keep Definitely. showing it. It's very important. And it brings up to me, as a psychologist, the tremendous need for more clinics and facilities of all sorts 
where people can either chill out, be soothed, or really have the appropriate high-level mental health care that they may need. It's just, you know, we have to assume that every time this happens, there are terrible problems behind what gets, what we only see as the shooter. Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah, if parents are missing signs, you know, and they see them a lot of the time, when you think about it, children are in school more hours a week than they are ever even home. Mm -hmm. So the school environment almost has a responsibility to the children. It's always been for their education and safety, but also for their mental health and how they feel and coping skills. Because um, they are there more when you think about it. Um, and the parents, I guess, as they get older, have less and less influence, right, for mm -hmm. teenagers. Um, the older you get, the less, you know, you're really interested in listening to what we have to say. <laughs> more influenced by peers and, and school events, I think. Yeah, it's almost as if <coughs> Now, teachers or that already have a burden of doing so much, but that they be trained in observation uh, skills that would help them if something may be awry, and mm -hmm. that they would know what those are possibly. It could be physical, it could be um, emotional, but be prepared. I don't, I don't think teachers or administrators are really prepared to, to make those observations mm -hmm. And a lot of schools do not have a school psychologist or have a part-time one that goes from school to school. Mm -hmm. There's no full-time mental health like a nurse mm -hmm. for most of these children. If you're feeling sick, you can go to the nurse. If you're feeling sad and alone, there's not much place to go. And, and is the school, um, how do the students feel that, is it a safe place environment that they can approach a teacher or a counselor or a nurse if they're there um, and, and feel safe enough to say, you know, um, I'm having these thoughts. I'm not feeling comfortable in my body. Um, something's bothering me. Well, let's ask our two kids. Right. Were we able to get the uh, Madison back in Florida? There she is. Mm -hmm. Hi, Madison. Hi. Hi. We're, we're asking a question. I don't know if you got to see some of the film or not. Did you? I wasn't able to see the, the film, but. Okay. All right, but hang in because you'll, you can answer this question. The question is, um, do, you, do you feel um, that you could go to the school nurse or the guidance counselor or somewhere in your school and talk to someone where you could really share that you weren't feeling quite right today or you needed someone to talk to. And I'm asking both you and Ilana. Um, yes. Uh, I usually go, if I'm having a rough day, I would usually go to one of my like really good teachers that I know personally. And talking to a teacher is like, really nice T like having a teacher there talk to talk to or a guidance counselor or like you said a clinic um really helps mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yes and and uh you there's enough people in your school that you've been able to establish those ties yes ma'am that's great yeah, mm -hmm. in, my, in my school, I have a lot of um, very nice teachers. I know if I ever had any issues or problems, I could go to really most of them. Actually, you, you know, I think really any of them, to be honest. In my school, I think we have some really nice teachers, and they're, they're ready really to listen to whatever you have to say. Um, and we also have, um, we have a counselor upstairs in room D200 that I know some of my friends go to whenever they're having a day or whenever just not fit really feeling it they'll go up to her and then they can get like a pass to go back to class so that's wonderful so actually we've got two out of two schools that mm -hmm. right here and that's that's good um, but we have to also remember that a lot of these incidents are happening by people that are 18 or above um, and that means that 
they may no longer, first of all, they may not have had a school that had as much to offer as yours. But secondly, they may be out, lonely, um, feeling isolated, or had, had a loss in the family, or a girlfriend that broke up, or, you know, a hundred thousand things. And how, as a society, can we become a little more astute toward them? Like in your movie, the mother didn't really realize it, nor did anyone pick, it, pick up that maybe he was really suffering. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you felt this, but both these beautiful girls said they had teachers they were really comfortable talking to. Mm -hmm. But if teachers, if you say something to a teacher, they are obligated by law to report certain things. That's I think true. a lot of students know that. So it's great to have someone to talk to, but someone who's trained to help you you know, a trained psychologist, mm -hmm. a social worker, is very different than being able to talk to a teacher, which is lovely. But if you have really deep, horrible thoughts, and you say, I'm thinking of hurting myself, I want to hurt people in the school, the teacher's obligated to get uh, police involved in other things, and you might be less likely to confide in a teacher knowing that versus a social worker who is readily available or mm -hmm. a clinician. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Well, you're also, I am thinking that perhaps those who are in real need mm -hmm. may not access those sources for mm -hmm. a variety of reasons. Um, and no, I don't know what right. one would do about that. Well, that's mm. something we have to think about. And I often think about, like, the first time uh, I went to Israel, the, they interview you. Um, do you have a package that someone gave you? And some of these things have come, they're quite ordinary now with many countries when you're traveling. But behind that training, those questions are really irrelevant. What they've been trained to do is look at people's eyes and the tension in their, <laughs> their faces. I'm losing my headpiece. And um, their, their um, body stance and all sorts of things. And they may take a person aside and say, come with me into this room, you know, whatever. Not because of any of the verbal answers, but because they gave off enough subtle psychological clues. Mm -hmm. And I think we've been very lax in this country. I know, um, I don't think the training, what we give as training often for different roles that we ask people to play isn't really as high as it could be. Mm -hmm. right. And for this type of recognition of a possible shooter, you need really a high, high level stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I agree on a somatic level, uh, which is dealing with the wisdom of the body and, and how the body moves and what it's tr trying to say. The body is very expressive as to what you're thinking. All right, your thoughts come through much quicker in your body than what you actually say. Mm -hmm. And so, right, it, it is, we need people that are trained in observation skills to, to know when it's appropriate to pull somebody aside and not, whether it's at the airports or schools. Nowadays, it could really be anywhere. And yeah. if we had, say, enough walk-in clinics and storefront places that were basically had a... Uh, a well-trained social worker there uh, as well and maybe higher you know even a higher level trained person if necessary many people who end up sitting you know just sitting in the street homeless I mean people would I think enter some of these intermediary facilities if they were there and common and it was easy to do and you got a free meal and you could sit and relax a while and then people can judge you I mean not that the intent is just to judge mm -hmm. but as a teacher I can tell you exactly what kind of training we have to look for um, they tell us specific things you know of course bruises um, drastic change in behavior, drastic change in eating habits, dropping grades, and these are very kind of vague things and anything that's noticed you have to report and that takes the burden off of you. 
But sometimes it's really hard to tell if they're having an off day. But if it continues, you have an obligation to report that to somebody else. But there's only so much as an educator that you can do. You have to refer, be able to know those subtle mm -hmm. things. Yeah. And it's a hard training to have. Um, we get general training on those cues that you're talking right, about. But then right. we're, we have to report and offer that up to someone else to talk to them. Well, that's yeah. a good start. Yeah. Um, I'd like to play my little film because I promised myself I want to, uh, and we have a star here from yeah. it. And then I, there's only one other thing we can do because we're, we have to stop at eight, um, is I want you to think uh, about a couple of wishes that you have for our society. Whenever I interview and test a child, I'll, there's a thing you can ask like, what, what would be your three wishes, you know? So see if anything comes to you and maybe we can leave our audience with that. So, where are you getting your hair cut and colored these days? Salon L, downtown. How much do they charge? I don't know. My mom paid. <laughs> okay, Miss Privilege. Wow, this color looks so good. How was that um, chemistry test for you? Uh, it was okay. Uh, so like is so hard. Yeah, it's the worst. <sighs> Hear that? Was yeah. that gunshots? I don't know. This is Principal Howard. This is an emergency. Initiate lockdown procedures. I repeat, this is Principal Howard. This is an emergency. Initiate lockdown procedure. This is not a test. Oh my god. Oh, oh my god. Okay. Oh my god, um, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Quiet, quiet. Listen. Um, we're gonna die. We're gonna die. No, we're gonna die. Get in there. This can't be happening. This can't be happening. Oh my god. Oh my god. How is this happening? It'll be okay as long as we keep quiet. No, no, I can't. I'm okay. It's okay. Taft is all clear. I repeat, Taft is all clear. This is Secretary Higgins. Thank God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. We're, we're still alive. Yeah. yeah. That was insane. I hope Brian's okay. Oh my God. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> now where's where are your bodies? <laughs> Have to sigh. Yeah, let it go. Sigh of relief. Let yes. that heaviness yes. lift off. Yes. Yeah. Let's send it out. Let it dissipate. So let's start with you, Teresa. Let's go around and all share our wishes for our beautiful country that we love. I wish that from a young age there was more support for mothers with children to start um, from the very, very beginning, no matter what their situation, and help all along to school age as well as through school. Um, it's very important to have that support and for mothers who don't. Um, I think it's much harder for them to get that soothing sensation that you mentioned. Um, and I think that the three girls in our film represent different homes, different tensions, different ideals, and it'd be really nice to be able to understand each other better um, from a young age, especially as young women, as in the film. Thank you. I think that I wish that 
societies all around can learn to um, can learn just really just learn how to solve these problems to work together to find ways to fix them maybe set up clinics or to even just help each other and for people to know that they can go to whoever to talk about whatever they want they have clinics or whatever open I just hope that societies can really just learn to communicate in that way and then maybe these problems might not show up so often thank you <coughs> I'd like to see from a very young age more kindness between one another regardless of age and abilities mm -hmm. that we recognize one another and are, and are trained from an early age to validate one another and hear one another to have those listening and coping skills and creating environments whether within our school or society at large that that people feel some place of safety and comfort without feeling they're going to be uh, harmed or antagonized or ridiculed. Beautiful. Well, I feel as a mental health provider, quote unquote, um, psychologist, that I wish there were many, many, many more uh, easy ways for people to receive the mental health care at any level that they need, whether it's just the comfort of um, a conversation with somebody who has some training, or whether it is the highest level uh, because someone is suffering from trauma or multiple personalities or hearing voices, <laughs> highest level of medical people that can prescribe medicines and uh, do the, the psychotherapy. And we're, we have a tremendous shortage in our country of, of people who are trained at the levels we need in the places where we need them. And then I think on a very practical level, the less dangerous things that we have in our society, the less happens. Uh, when drugs are easily available, people take them. When guns are easily available, people buy them or find them. And we are a society of consumption. And I would like to see that draw back. I think it would help a lot in the whole improvements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, what I was thinking before you said that was I would like to see lawmakers and policymakers do things to stop failing our young people and the future, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. like making resources more accessible, mm -hmm. mental health um, resources more accessible, and making guns less accessible. Mm -hmm. I was also thinking about stigma, the We're stigma not. of mental illness and of, like, yes. the mother even right. was, mm -hmm. had a stigma on her yes. from yes. that, yes. from her own child. Yeah. And last, we're going to have our guest from Florida. Mm -hmm. Please, what are your wishes? What um, are your wishes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> My wishes are peace and safety for all the kids and anyone in the world when they go to step into a building or a school or even a home. Um, another one is to, con um, to have more safety in guns and people, t like certain people who are allowed to get guns. I believe that's another thing that is a big thing in our like society and I want that to change because it's a big thing and like it affects a lot of things. Thank yeah. you. Simply Thank well you, stated. everybody, for your beautiful mm. statements and wishes. And uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a need to say just one more thing, and that's God bless America. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.